Hello and welcome to the sixth of our Academy special sessions. Today we're taking a step back to talk about global cooperation. It's the 75th anniversary of the United Nations this year, and the Secretary General has said that the world faces its gravest test since the founding of the organization. I'm Dan Thomas from the UN Global Compact uh, here in New York, and uh, I'm going to be joined by a very exciting panel we have for you today. The COVID-19 crisis underlines the need for strong institutions, multilateralism and global partnerships. Yet while this pandemic devastates communities and economies around the world, support for global cooperation lags. Effectively addressing the crisis requires an active response from governments, business and the whole of society. In fact, 95% of respondents to a global survey marking the UN's anniversary agreed on the need for countries to work together to manage global trends. And just yesterday, the leaders of a number of European countries and the leadership of the EU pledged to raise $8 billion to find vaccines and treatments for coronavirus and reaffirm their commitment to a multilateral response. Today, we have a great panel. I'd like to welcome Swazi Shabalala, the acting senior vice president of the African Development Bank and also its CFO. Uh, Dr. David Nabarro, the World Health Organization Director General's Special Envoy for COVID-19. Mr. Paul Pullman, the Vice Chair of the UN Global Compact and the co-founder and chair of Imagine, a new organization mobilizing business to tackle climate change and the global goals. And last but no, by no means least, uh, Dr. Ellen Dorsey, the Executive Director of the Wallace Global Fund. Thank you so much for joining us. Our conversation today focuses on global cooperation for crisis response. And we're joined by leaders from a number of sectors and perspectives and countries. So I'd like to kick off our discussion by asking each of you to very briefly share where you're joining from and what is top of mind for you today in addressing this uh, global crisis. Uh, Swazi, why don't you go first? Thank you very much, uh, Dan, uh, and thank you for this opportunity to talk to about uh, something which is very close to our hearts. Um, as you know, uh, you know the African Development Bank, uh, as Africa's development bank, uh, is at the heart of uh, efforts to assist African countries which are being absolutely devastated uh, by this pandemic. Um, and it is paramount that uh, all over, all over the world, the global community at large cooperates in order to assist these uh, countries. I am seeing the significant disruption in livelihoods that is taking place, the loss of income, particularly to poor households, informal businesses, and the small and medium enterprises. We now seem to be in the middle of a deep recession and various analysts and experts point towards very difficult days ahead. In Africa alone, GDP growth in 2020 could be cut by three to eight percentage points, which reverses the significant and hard-worn economic gains Africa has made over the last two decades in what has been, in fact, an unbroken growth trajectory. There's an urgent need for us to respond to the health emergency and ensure health systems in Africa, which in themselves have struggled over the years due to underinvestment, are adequately capacitated to manage and contain the spread of this pandemic. The bank, uh, in the early hours of the pandemic, uh, we launched an innovative, record-breaking $3 billion fight COVID-19 social bond the largest social bond to date to be issued in the capital markets. It listed on the London Stock Exchange on 3rd of April, 2020. We have also set aside another $5.5 billion to assist countries in Africa. This facility, which we call the COVID-19 response facility, was announced on the 8th of April which is and it's designed to help member countries curb the pandemic. Today, we faced with an unprecedented challenge resulting from a looming health and economic crisis. The global economy and the global community is keenly aware that this fight will not be won 
unless the disease is eradicated in the most vulnerable societies. Thank you, Deb. Thank you so much. Uh, David Nabara, why don't, you, uh, why don't you go next? Thank you very much, Dan. Just um, to build on what Swazi just said, uh, this is an extraordinarily big challenge. Uh, it's a new virus. It's a very dangerous virus. It mustn't be underestimated. It is transmitted through coughing and other respiratory actions. And so it means that actually you can avoid being infected if you're more than six feet away from somebody. And that's a terribly important reality. Uh, the outbreaks build up really, really fast through a direct transmission from person to person. They double in size every two and a half days. If unchecked, they increased 20, 30,000 times every five weeks. And so this means that getting on top of outbreaks quickly is key. My commitment and the reason why I'm here today is to help societies everywhere learn to live with the threat posed by this virus for as long as it's going to be necessary, I suspect, until we have a widespread effective vaccine. But until then, it's learning to live with COVID that's the new mantra. And I want to talk today about the importance of cooperation within countries, between countries, between government, business and civil society, between professions, and most importantly among people as we learn to live with this new threat. Thank you, David. Um, Ellen Dorsey, why don't you go next? Thanks, Dan. Um, good morning or good day, everyone. Um, I work at a foundation. Uh, it's a progressive foundation based in Washington, D.C., the area where I am currently uh, stationed. We work globally and in the U.S. to support social movements, to address climate, advance democracy, secure women's rights, and build new economic models. Top of my mind is the intersection of crises. COVID is exposing the fissures in our political and economic systems and laying bare the deep inequalities in our societies that we just can't hide from. Hundreds of millions are being displaced from jobs in the formal and informal economies, lack access to clean water, women face greater violence in their homes, food systems face collapse. And all of this is happening on top of systems teetering under the weight of climate impacts that will continue to bring catastrophic shocks to the system in droughts, fires, and storms. Intersecting crises require systemic, not merely palliative responses. And if ever there was a moment in which we are shaken out of our complacency and called to act with audacious intent and collaboration, it's now. Thank you, Ellen. Uh, Paul. Well, I was very, uh, thanks, Dan. I was very happy to hear uh, Ellen talk about a progressive organization in the U.S. I've always been told that when you deal with the U.S., you have to talk about forward thinking and avoid the word progressive. But we in Europe very much relate to the word progressive. So thank you for using that. But um, the, the uh, emphasis for us has really been to rally the private sector uh, individually and collectively to a higher level of behavior. And we're doing that obviously with the 12,000 members in the UN Global Compact. We're doing that with the 48 million members of the International Chamber of Commerce, which I chair. We're doing that with the WEF. We're doing that with the B20 and then the B team influencing the, uh, the B20 influencing the G20. An enormous effort has been uh, um, uh, unlocked, if you want to. Uh, enormous cooperations have been established that were unthinkable a few weeks ago even, to save first and foremost the livelihoods, uh, the, the lives that uh, David Navarro so eloquently talked about, but also protecting the livelihoods. My main focus is really now not only on sticking the course, uh, but more importantly, the developing markets, ensure that they get their fair share of attention, the debt relief, the support, the materials, and that they are on everybody's screen. And the second one is to start to think about not restarting the global economy, but redesigning the global economy. We're going in from a starting point that is not pretty. The biggest recession we have certainly seen and the biggest recession certainly this century. And we need to be sure that we have not only a strong um, demand creation again to 
lift many people out of poverty, but more importantly, that we design for the right type of growth and do that together. And next to the developing markets and this redesign, the third focus, not surprisingly, is what was mentioned before, on trying to come out a little bit better than we went in with our global governance, our partnerships, our multilateralism, because that has clearly shown some cracks over the last few weeks more than ever. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Um, David Nabarro, the, the COVID-19 crisis has really demonstrated just how crucial multilateral institutions are to our collective health, prosperity and security. Um, the World Health Organization is leading the response. As a special envoy, uh, tell us a bit about your role and what the message is from the World Health Organization to business. Thanks very much. Uh, and I want to just say how delighted I am to be connected to 570 different people uh, from all over the world. This is an extraordinary opportunity and a privilege for me. And so I'm really going to reiterate some of the words that have been spoken by Tedros, the Director General of the World Health Organization, and his senior officials. The, the point that they make again and again is that the virus is here to stay. And that what all of us are gonna to have to do is to learn to live with the virus as an ever-present threat in our lives and in our communities. And so the first thing that we all have to do is to learn about the virus and to make sense of it in our heads, to shift our mindsets a bit and recognize that it's actions that we each take in our homes, in our communities, in our workplaces, and beyond, that will determine whether or not ourselves and our communities are able to be defended against this virus. Now, these actions will be about maintaining physical distance as much as we possibly can. They will include being extremely careful about our respiratory hygiene, not coughing over other people, and if we are unwell, trying to actually avoid contact with anybody because the most important requirement is that we don't spread the disease. Now, that's kind of fairly straightforward to do in your own home or with your family, but it gets much tougher if you're working in a place where actually you do have to be close to people. It's tough also if you're on a very low income and you can't afford to take time off work because you're unwell. And so we're gonna to have to build in to the way in which we work, a real understanding that it's responsible and valued if people do take their health seriously and do isolate themselves if they have symptoms that may well be COVID, even before they get tested. And remember, for most people in most of the world, getting a COVID test is a pretty tough job. So being able to isolate the moment you have symptoms that might be COVID, that's the key. And so what does this mean for businesses? It means that business practices do have to enable physical distancing at the workplace or in connection with customers, or indeed in any activity where people come together, such as for example, markets. And at the same time, a business needs to be able to trust employees when they say they're not well and to recognize that this is an action that is good for the rest of the team and good for society. And the reason why this is so important, as I think many of us now realize, is you just can't treat this virus lightly. You can't treat it like influenza. You can't treat it like the common cold because this virus really has the capacity to make people seriously ill and to kill them, especially if they've got other diseases or if they're older, like my age range. I'm in that group that are thought to be at high risk. And so business practice will change. Different governments are working out what rules they want to create for how businesses should work. They're working out an, an guidance on safe public transport. They're working out what they're asking of employees if they're particularly high risk environments like residential care for older people. 
And it will take a few weeks as lockdowns are released for the new business practices to emerge. They'll be discussed by businesses together with local health authorities because the health authorities will be issuing instructions. For example, some will ask for the reg regular wearing of face protection or face coverings, particularly on public transport. So businesses will have to adapt to what the local authority suggests and will have to be prepared sometimes for the rapid reimposition of localized movement restrictions if new outbreaks break out. But I think that all businesses can get themselves into a position where they're discussing with their employees how they can best work and have fun and contribute to the continuity of their businesses while minimizing the risk to each other and to people beyond the business through physical distancing, through really being responsible if you get ill, through protecting those who are most vulnerable and through other measures that will be introduced in the coming weeks and months. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, David. Swazi Shabalala, um, you said that the African Development Bank's uh, launched an uh, extraordinary uh, response facility, uh, an innovative bond uh, to, to fight COVID-19. What, what do you expect the socioeconomic impacts uh, are going to be in Africa and how will this response be used to, to address those impacts? Thank you very much, uh, Dan, and uh, this has been a very interesting, very illuminating uh, discussion. I think about some of the um, you know, solutions being proposed, and uh, I consider Africa's ability to actually be able to implement uh, you know, those, uh, those solutions. Um, the devastation is wide ranging uh, and uh, you know, will be very, very difficult for countries uh, to come out of. In fact, the president of the bank, right at the beginning of this pandemic, uh, made it clear that uh, in fact, uh, for Africa, social distancing should not mean fiscal distancing. So we have been focused with our sister organizations to try and mobilize resources for the continent particularly in the first instance to help with the health response uh, because many of these countries have very limited ability to respond from a, from a health point of view, but to also help these countries themselves, many of which are dependent on oil exports, on other commodity exports, uh, and with the shutdown in global trade, uh, that has been impossible. Uh, many of them have no buffers and no capacity to actually be able to help their own citizens uh, deal with uh, loss of income, uh, as an example. Other countries have been able to announce multi-trillion uh, you know, dollar responses. Very few African countries are in a position to do that. So we have actually focused uh, a great deal on how we can help these countries uh, along with our sister organizations. So the primary response behind uh, our COVID response facility is to provide a fast, flexible and effective response to lessen the severe economic and social impact of COVID-19 on African countries. And I would sum up the overall aims of our response as follows. So the CRF will provide cost-effective and targeted emergency budget support uh, through a fast-track approval process to provide immediate relief to countries to address the crisis. Additional resources for public health interventions, social protection programs, and to protect their economies at a time of global volatility and uncertainty. In addition to this, uh, the facility will offer liquidity to countries facing fiscal and balance of payment stresses, which are significant, to ensure their stability and to allow for the maintenance of core public services and social infrastructure during this emergency period. The facility also considered the needs of the private sector with a dedicated envelope to support existing clients of the bank, uh, in particular financial intermediaries, who will enable us to directly reach out and support SMEs and women-led businesses, uh, which are very important in many African economies. 
It will also offer financing support in a sustainable way that avoids deepening the existing debt burden on these countries, building on the gains in resilience achieved in recent years. A recent estimate by the African Union uh, was that Africa would need uh, between 100 billion to 150 billion to be able to deal with this crisis. So our facility of $10 billion is a drop in the ocean. There's been other responses from the World Bank and other international organizations. But it is quite clear that, uh, you know, Africa may not perhaps from a health point of view be as badly affected, uh, you know, as other countries uh, in the world. But the fact of the matter is that uh, in some respects, we may be the worst affected from an economic point uh, point of view. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Swazi. And, and you say uh, not, not, not worst affected, but uh, I guess uh, the, the, only the future will tell uh, how this uh, virus plays out in, in Africa and, and around the world. We're, we're, still seeing the, uh, we're still seeing the scenarios uh, playing out uh, uh, around the world. Paul, you've, uh, you've written that responsible businesses that look after stakeholders may be better place to weather this crisis. Um, tell us about the role of business in the response and why purpose-driven companies might have an advantage. Yeah, I'll, I'll do that with uh, pleasure. But uh, first, I want to just say one thing. We keep talking about social distancing. What we really should be talking about is physical distancing and social approach. More than ever, do we need to be socially connected so whoever discovered those words and started using them didn't work for a marketing company. It's very important that we are socially more connected. It was Martin Luther King who said that we are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied to a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. And that is a very important thing. If we've learned anything from this crisis, as David was saying at the beginning of this talk, is the absolute need of cooperation and our mutual interdependency as citizens of planet Earth, which also means taking core responsibility for helping uh, countries or continents like Africa. What we've also learned very clearly, which is very important, is that you cannot have healthy people on an unhealthy planet. And the business community has certainly discovered that during this crisis. We've been simply too slow to react to the threats that we have seen coming around planetary boundaries climate change being one, but may I add also inequality. This current crisis risks putting over half a billion people back into poverty. And we've also discovered that our most precious jobs, the healthcare workers, the transport workers, the people working in stores, the ones who provide us food in the agricultural uh, value chain are often jobs that are in the informal economy or very poorly protected. And that has been exposed as well. The good thing is, that what we have seen is that businesses at large, there are exceptions, so I want to be clear, but businesses at large have rallied to the challenge. We've seen that businesses that have always operated under a longer term multi-stakeholder model were not only better prepared to deal with this crisis, but actually are also coming out of this crisis stronger in general. And that's a good thing to see. Now, why is that the case then? The first one is businesses that ran a multi stakeholder model did not leverage up their balance sheet. These were businesses that did not engage in excessive share buybacks or special dividends or executive compensations that were way out of sight with the actual performance of a company. They were responsibly run and they have more resilience. The second thing that we see is that in this crisis, more than ever, you need a workforce that is engaged, that is motivated and can take decisions. This is a dispersed leadership that is needed now more than ever and multi-stakeholder models that took care of their employees are probably better placed to deal with that. We've seen enormous disruptions in the value chain and here again companies that have always worked with their partners in the value chain with mutual respect, with, with dignity, with, with uh, equalness if you want to in, in, in many cases have a more robust value chain to deal with this. So companies that are entirely focused on making this a better world, not surprisingly, will be the companies that will be embraced now and in the future. And that you start to see happen. 
75% of the consumers are, or, or citizens of this world are saying they want companies to be active participants in finding the solutions. And if they don't, I simply won't buy from them anymore. Not surprisingly, we also see the financial market moving uh, into this direction. Half of the funds under management are now saying, I want to find out how companies treat their employees, what plans they have, what risks they run in situations like this and how well they are protected from a social and not only an environmental or financial point of view. So we see the financial markets moving as well. And when citizens of this world move, when financial markets move, then it's not surprising to say also more businesses start to move and they would be all the better for it. Thank you, Paul. And in fact, you talked about the, uh, the global uh, supply chain and the, the effect of this on that. We, we're just, uh, in fact, the Global Compact's just today issuing a, a press release uh, uh, and a task force report from our Sustainable Ocean Business Action Platform warning about the, uh, the, the global shipping uh, um, uh, ability slowing down, partly because the workers on ships, the seafarers that, that run those vessels that move goods around the world are basically uh, prevented from traveling because of the travel restriction, which has the potential to really slow down you know, all of the movement by ship around the world, which uh, accounts for about 90% of, yeah. uh, of supply chain management. So that's uh, very concerning. Uh, Ellen Dorsey, um, in response to the pandemic, your foundation announced that you'll spend 20% of the endowment on grants to address the impact of this crisis. Uh, this is a significant increase over the typical annual amount. What led to this decision and, and what's the role of philanthropy in, in the response to this global crisis. Yeah, thank you. Philanthropy, both private philanthropy and corporate philanthropy has a potentially enormous role to play. And frankly, we have massive resources to contribute to meet basic needs, defend rights against repression happening under the guise of COVID response, fund crucial research, health research, ensure the recovery is a just and sustainable one by supporting advocacy, and partnering, frankly, with other sectors. Right now, civil society organizations are trying to meet unprecedented needs around the world that governments can't fill, while facing reductions in funds, both private and governmental funds. This means more staff are being laid off, organizations have less capacity to address needs when they're the greatest. When they face these financial challenges, at the same time, as staff are adjusting to virtual work, are stressed out by family duties and caring for the sick. Yet we need a strong civil society now more than ever. And if there was ever a moment where philanthropy should pour it on, it is now. Most foundations, family offices, donor advised funds, house significant assets in endowments that grow larger when invested, frankly, in the very same financial systems and corporations that ironically have driven our environmental and economic problems that we fund those organizations to try and solve. It should be noted that many foundations are starting to invest in a mission aligned way, our foundation is. But in good times, we grow our in investments and endowments and pay out only a fraction of that in, in grants. In the US, we have a mandated 5% payout for foundations and none for other types of philanthropy called donor advised funds. These rules differ around the world, but historically in the past when markets drop, so too does big philanthropy. And if history is a guide, the majority of donors will not increase or sustain their payouts over time and won't collaborate at the scale and at the level this crisis demands. So what are we holding on to our money for? What are future problems that are worse than this? Now there are standouts. Many foundations are doing innovative things. Gates is investing huge sums of money into a vaccine. The Skoll Foundation just last week committed to quadrupling its payout with a powerful commitment to building a response capacity in Africa. There are other examples I can enumerate. Um, our foundation that I manage did make this commitment. As part of our COVID response, we're funding relief efforts and advocacy capacity of those hardest hit, particularly Native and Indigenous communities. 
We're funding mass mobilizations to ensure social justice and climate are at the center of any recovery. We're trying to strengthen the capacity of movements by helping them adapt to digital and virtual organizing. We're supporting advocacy on access to water, particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa, and increasing support for women's rights. But our foundation's small, and we need all foundations to do more and collaborate it in unprecedented ways. Therefore, we're now calling for a change in the policies governing our sector in the U.S., where there is a tremendous amount of philanthropic dollars to raise the mandatory minimum payout from 5% to 10%. If we did this just for the next three years, we'd create an extra $200 billion in aid to civil society with no cost to taxpayers. So what are we sheltering our assets for? Greater need in the future? Or should we be putting our money to work now and, and radically collaborating within our sector and across sectors for real systemic change? To do anything less is failing in our core mission to serve society. I ask everyone on this call to help us lift this call to action up across philanthropy, including for corporate philanthropy, to pledge to give more, give now, and do it in a way that really moves the needle on the urgent needs and the system change that's required. Thank you, Ellen. And just to put that $200 billion figure in perspective, um, just to reflect that Swazi mentioned that Africa will need between 100 and 150 billion to recover and to deal with this crisis. So that really puts the uh, the strength of U.S. philanthropy in in context uh, in a very uh, a very powerful way. But absolutely, thank you so much. COVID-19 has highlighted our vulnerability to global crises uh, like climate change and future pandemics, and has reinforced the need to build more inclusive, sustainable, and resilient economies and societies to face these global challenges. The Secretary General has called for the international, uh, uh, international cooperation to address the crisis and to recover better. He stated that ending the pandemic everywhere is both a moral imperative and a matter of enlightened self-interest. We face a colossal test which demands decisive, coordinated, and innovative action from all, for all. I'd like each of you just to reflect briefly on this statement, share your thoughts on how we can mobilize business, government, international institutions, philanthropists, and civil society around cooperation and collaborative leadership towards response, recovery, and resilience. So uh, David Nabarro, why don't we start with you? Because I know you may need to go soon. Um, what is your role in, in promoting this global cooperation that we need. Thanks very much indeed. Um, gosh, what an interesting panel. Let me just start by saying it's all about what we do. It's not so much about what we say, though that's important. It's what we actually do when we're making decisions all the time now. And the first part of this is that we're all making sense of this new reality of a dangerous virus that's now in our midst, transmitted very easily, capable of causing quite major harm, uh, and we have to make sense of it together at the same time, and quickly. We don't have a huge amount of time to be thinking about it and cogitating because decisions are having to be made now. People are suffering now. Businesses are going bankrupt now. Communities are hurting now. Now, some of that making sense has to be done sector by sector. You've got the whole health sector going to change, the residential care sector changing, transport sector changing, tourism changing, food, nutrition changing, education changing, and many more. Law and order completely changing. Look at the number of prisons where there are riots underway right now. Going sector by sector, making sense of it, is what everybody on this call ought to be doing as much time as they can. And it requires constant dialogue. This is not something where a switch clicks in your head. Oh yeah, I get it. That's what being COVID ready means. Nope. It's actually quite a complex process for all of us. Certainly in my case, it's been difficult, still is. And it goes on because the more you hear, the more you understand, the more you have to shift your thinking. 
This is going to be a new normal, Dan, a new normal. Not the same. Not going back to what was there even five months ago. It's going to be a new life. And thinking that through, and thinking while we are doing this sense-making, how can we get it right? Actually, even more, because COVID's the great revealer of so many inequities and inadequacies in the systems we have now, it's actually giving a chance to just look at the challenges that are faced and say, we can do better, better. That's what colleagues have been saying on this call, and I think that's really important. And that's why what Mr. Guterres was saying is so massively important. He said, you've got a chance. You've got a chance now to reconstruct, reinvent, reimagine, but do it in a way that puts equity first instead of last, that puts women first instead of last that puts the interests of these people who are in the informal economy, on whom we all depend, much higher. Puts the health sector higher, instead of paying people in the health sector next to nothing and requiring them to have to do multitasking and then get endangered and in some cases being killed as a result of the work they do. Let's treat them properly. So that's my second part to it. Not only do we need to be making sense of it, but we need to be thinking, how can we contribute to lives that are just better. And just some last comments on this. Dan, you can't do this without being able to work together. A city on its own, a state on its own, part of a country on its own, or even a nation on its own, trying to work out these massively difficult challenges and then trying to establish little bubbles for interaction that will be safe and happy, like two countries saying, we'll fly between our countries, but we won't fly anywhere else. No, 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 no. This needs collaboration, cooperation, sharing, learning together like nothing else. We've all said it, and Mr. Guterres says it again and again till he's blue in the face almost. But instead of waiting for political leaders who seem to have found reasons not to collaborate, I encourage every business leader, every professional, every civil society member, every university teacher to make a special point of connecting with others, particularly those who you don't normally connect with. Don't leave anybody out. Make sure you connect with people from countries that are much poorer than yours. Make sure you connect with people from countries that have a different political ideology than yours. Because actually connecting is the only way we will manage this. If we're going to avoid leaving individuals, leaving communities, leaving nations behind. And that's the danger. If we don't connect, people will be left behind. And so we have to connect. We have to learn. We have to share. We have to form new alliances. We have to promise to each other like we'd never before. We have to be accountable like never before. And then I think we have a really good chance, not just of learning to live with the COVID, but also learning to stop the reversal of biodiversity loss. Sorry, learning to stop biodiversity loss. I get confused on my negatives. Learning to act on climate change, adaptation, resilience, and mitigation. Learning to change our food systems so they're truly sustainable. Learning to treat prisoners in a way that respects their human rights. Learning to look after older people so they're valued members of society. And the people who care for them are loved and treasured and not forced to work in absolutely appalling circumstances. There's so much we can do, but that requires us to share. And then the politicians, they'll come along in due course when they realize that that will get them votes. But for the time being, some of them are stuck. We say we help them to come. We, help, we show them that cooperation is the only way to make a better world. And fragmentation, as we've seen within many countries that have had fragmented responses, even to the COVID, fragmentation puts you at risk. Look at how Africa has come together through the African Union with solidarity, with really strong leadership and good sense on how to deal with the virus. Look at how India is dealing with things at the moment. Look at many countries in Latin America. 
they have done what was right. They are working together. They're showing the rest of the world what to do. Thank you. David, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, I know you may have to leave, so we'll, uh, we'll say uh, thank you very much from, from all of us on the, on the call. Thank you for your leadership uh, and your words of encouragement and warning and, uh, and optimism as well uh, in dealing with this crisis. Um, Swazi Shabalala, uh, uh, please reflect on the, uh, the idea that we have to work together to mobilize government, business, international institutions, philanthropists, civil society. What's your role in, uh, in Africa in promoting this, this kind of cooperation? So uh, I really am so moved by what uh, David has just shared because I think it's a very African thing to talk about no one should be left behind. And I think given the nature of this disease, it's absolutely vital that we understand that it's not possible to isolate it to a continent, to a country, to a region, to a group. So cooperation is absolutely vital for all of us to be able to be well and function in this new reimagined society. So from my vantage point and what I have seen and witnessed, there has been a very strong response from the entire community, global community, African community, working together towards a solution. We've seen huge donations and commitment made by philanthropists. Uh, Bill Gates was mentioned, uh, Jack Ma in China, you know, all kinds of uh, international organizations, civil society organizations, celebrities and the general public who've all responded in various ways to this challenge. This goes all the way up to the global community of nations, including governments themselves and groupings such as the G20, the African Union, that have helped to spearhead and champion a debt relief response for low-income countries. From the African Development Bank perspective, we work very closely, not just with our regional and non-regional shareholders, but also our peers such as the World Bank, uh, all other regional MDBs, and the World Health Organization. In fact, we have a number of projects with them on the continent uh, that we try to roll out uh, uh, together in response uh, to this challenge. More recently, the G20 has challenged MDBs to come up with additional support measures to help with debt relief for the poorest and most vulnerable countries. This builds on widespread calls by President Adeshina, the president of our bank, for debt suspension for poor countries. These are all obviously ongoing activities. And in addition to this coordination and collaboration across multilaterals, we are also working with a range of other development partners to jointly co-finance programs and projects in places where our country coverage overlaps. We also uh, regularly looking for new and innovative ways to ensure we do more and are effective in our interventions. So I will leave it there. I think the African Development Bank is ready to partner, ready to coordinate, ready to co uh, cooperate and use our advantage of the presence uh, on the ground in countries throughout Africa to help the African Union, to help the G20 and to help other global initiatives in order to uh, assist Africa to make this transition to this new global um, paradigm. Thank you very much. Swazi Shalabala from the African uh, Development Bank. Thank you so much for joining us. I know that you may also have to leave, so we'll we'll thank you for joining us and and uh, uh, and say goodbye if you if you need to slip away. Um, uh, Ellen Dorsey, uh, please uh, you reflect. And to what extent is this is this crisis an opportunity as well to change the way that we operate and to change our systems? Yeah, absolutely. And building off something Paul said earlier, I mean, let's be clear, this recovery cannot be about recovering from a pandemic and resulting economic crisis. If we approach this moment as something we must recover from and cooperation results in simply rebooting our existing economic practices, we will have failed at the fundamental task before us and that's this system change. We can't resume the practices that predate this conflagration of crises or simply recover. Instead, we must revitalize the very notion of global cooperation. We need to rebuild the social contract. 
We need to renew commitment to a shared global prosperity that puts human rights, workers and women's rights, and sustainability at the center, not as garnishes on a broken system. This pandemic and the economic downward spiral has laid bare the fundamental fissures in our broken systems. We're the most vulnerable, most often as a result of grotesque inequality and structural discrimination in nearly every corner of the world. Um, will continue to bear the worst impacts. Here in the US, African Americans are dying at a much higher level than others from COVID, reflecting conditions of poverty, inadequate health access, and exposure to pollution that's weakened respiratory capacities. If ever there was a moment in recent history where we must come together to develop a bold global and systemic response, it has to be now, and in fact, it was the collapse of the last Gilded Age, the Great Depression, and another health crisis that created the conditions and societal upheaval that led to the New Deal in the US. We must now have a global Green New Deal with global mobilization to create high quality and life-sustaining jobs, to build infrastructure that delivers clean water and energy access for all. It can't be rhetoric. It has to be based on concrete policies um, of shared prosperity. And I just want to say, we are witnessing today waves of popular movements demanding a new way, not a return to the past. Hundreds of organizations worldwide have signed on to the five global principles for a just recovery. Labor groups and civil society organizations are coming together in unprecedented coalitions at the national level from South Africa to the U.S., to put concrete demands on the table to ensure that relief money goes to the most vulnerable. They will not tolerate corporate giveaways or bailouts that do not directly invest in preserving jobs, health benefits, and pensions when 300 million or more will be unemployed or no longer able to access informal markets. There will be mass dissent and upheaval if real benefit does not occur. We have to end this gilded, second gilded age or risk these upheavals. And, climate, and on top of that, the climate catastrophe barreling down on us. Tinkering around the edges is not going to get us there. We need to rebuild a modern day social contract where governments serve the people and not their donors or the economic elite, where companies create stakeholder and community agreement on their social benefit, and society holds them both to basic principles of human rights and democratic decision making. And frankly, if corporations do not partner with besieged governments and understand that they're losing their very instruments to serve society, the corporations face not only losing their social license, but losing their very markets for goods. So it's in their own interest to work as, with stakeholders. It's a moment for companies that are part of this global compact to recreate their very relationship to society and to government to redesign the purpose and charter of the corporation, to establish accountability to both shareholders, stakeholders, and future generations. That is not radical or naive ambition. It may be the only path to a functioning society in which businesses can uh, be viable and shared prosperity can be realized. Furthermore, functioning, viable, respected international institutions like the UN, are central to the creation of a new global social contract and an ambitious and rights-respecting global Green New Deal. And our sector, philanthropy, needs to play a critical role in resourcing the mobilization to achieve this kind of systemic change. We need champions for audacious change, for system change, not a reboot, not a recovery, but a renewal of purpose. Each sector, business, finance, philanthropy, and government, plays a necessary and vital role. It's going to be tough, but I know we're all in for the challenge. Thank you so much, Ellen Dorsey from the Global Wallace Fund. Thank you so much for those remarks. And uh, finally to Paul, we've just got a few minutes left. Paul, uh, maybe we can have your final reflections. And also uh, one of the questions that keeps coming uh, on the chat is around the SDGs, uh, the, the 2030 Agenda and the, the, uh, the Global uh, Climate Agreement from Paris. Uh, are those still the best roadmap to get us out of this situation? Well, I really enjoyed the comments of all uh, three uh, previous speakers, Farsi, David and Ellen. We, we frankly don't have a choice. The alternative doesn't exist. 
what you've seen right now is really that we're paying a price for not having acted earlier and having factored faster. The COVID crisis, more than anything else, has shown again the major cracks and the fragility that we have in our current uh, growth system, where we play with the planetary boundaries, where we exclude people from participating in the system, where we uh, have an incredible skewedness towards a few people that benefit and many who feel that they are paying the price, and it simply is not sustainable. I've often said that the cost of not acting has become higher than the cost of acting, and I think this crisis is showing you that. Now already where we are with China, the US, Europe, we've spent probably about 10 trillion and just to stabilize the economy. And it's not even done. We probably end up with unemployment levels of about 200 million here, half a billion more into poverty. We need to spend major amounts to come out of this. And I think once more the sustainable development goals, which were signed by 193 countries in September 2015 in the UN, which has as a simple call to irreversibly eradicate poverty and do that in the more sustainable and equitable way is more valid now than ever. We need to redesign our social contract with society to make it more equitable and inclusive. We need to redesign the way we produce and feed our people in this world. We need to redesign the way we build infrastructures and how we live. And yes, we need to provide different healthcare systems as well as, as um, investing in technology or <clears throat> technology of the future. Those are better jobs. Those are more jobs. They provide a better quality of life. And frankly, they're more secure jobs because they're the jobs of the future. We don't have a choice. And the Sustainable Development Goals is a print, is a enormous guiding framework for all of us to work from. And companies that have done it, that especially embrace goal number 17, the partnerships are getting handsomely rewarded for that, and I think are well placed for the future. The UN Global Compact and its 10 principles are more valid now than ever. The UN Global Compact has put out the SDG Action Manager that I encourage everybody to look at. But the magnitude of the challenges that we have to solve is so big that nobody can do it alone. Hence, the most important goal right now, goal number 17, partnership. Partnership for the common good. Partnership by putting the interests of others ahead of our own, knowing that by doing so, we are all better off. Partnership for multi-generations. That's the type of partnership we need right now. And I'm glad that our previous speakers on the panel fully embrace that as well. Thank you very much for those, uh, those closing comments, Paul Pullman. Uh, we've just got a few moments left to wrap up, to uh, just reflect on some of the key messages that have come out. We've got to be physically distant, but socially connected. We cannot be healthy people on an unhealthy planet. And that doesn't just mean climate change. It means inequality as well. A dispersed leadership is needed more than ever. A new normal, a new life. How can we get it right? Um, let's make a special point of connecting with others. Connecting is the only way we will change this. Uh, cooperation is the only way to create a better world. So I'd like to thank uh, Paul Pullman, Ellen Dorsey, Swazi Shabalala, and Dr. David Nabarro. Thank you so much. This has been a really uh, interesting and challenging uh, ac academy session. Uh, we're getting great feedback from around the world. We've had people from Vietnam and Australia, from China, Angola, Malaysia. We've had Egypt, uh, Wales, Mauritius, Canada, UK, Spain, Brazil. We've had people from around the world joining us. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, and our next special series uh, on Uniting Business to respond to COVID-19 will be next week on Tuesday, May the 12th. We'll be running these sessions a bit differently. We're going to host six consecutive sessions showcasing regional perspectives on leadership in a global crisis. Uh, to our audience, you're invited to join one or all six of these sessions. Uh, the link to register is in the chat box. We'll start with regional perspectives from China, followed by Asia Pacific, then the Middle East, Africa, Latin America, and the Caribbean. And finally, uh, to Europe. And also coming up on the 15th and 16th of June, the UN Global Compact's 20th Anniversary Leaders Summit, 
we will be doing that online. We expect it to be uh, the largest, most inclusive gathering of the UN Global Compact participants uh, we've ever we've ever done, and everybody is invited. You can find a, a link to register on our on our website. Thank you very much indeed for joining us today. Thank you to our panelists. Uh, that's over and out from New York. Goodbye. Thank you.